Okay, I already know what you're thinking. How the hell can they power it up to be ultimate? Like, what does that even mean? Well, let's start with the world. Yes, the world. People live on it. In fact, they live on it so hard that many groups banded together to section off parts of it from other parts that they didn't necessarily agree with. While these so-called countries can and do disagree plenty, there is one thing that a lot of them did agree upon. Electricity is neato and some people might want it in their homes and or businesses. Unfortunately, the agreeing didn't last long, since we see almost every country adopting a different connector shape or power standard, many wildly incompatible with each other. Hell, some countries couldn't even agree between themselves. Now for most people this isn't a big deal, right? You buy something in your country, it works in your country. But what if you're a big dumb nerd that does big dumb things like buy foreign electronics or go to different countries a lot with your electronics? Or at least used to. Well, then you might have a problem. While many electronics are universal in that they work on any home power standard, many also aren't. Exhibit A, my Nintendo 64. It's an American model because, you know, f playing retro games at 50 hertz. So my N64 is American and so is its 120 volt power supply. Now where I live, the power from the wall is 230 volts, basically twice as much power as this thing is rated for. And I don't think I need to explain what would happen if I plugged it in. So I don't. I have a step down transformer to, you know, step down the voltage so my US and Japanese consoles aren't overwhelmed. But it's kind of a pain. It's heavy, it's bulky, it's another thing that I have to take out and put away when I'm using my game consoles. I would love to not have to do that. So let's stop doing that. Game consoles tend to, by and large, not be universal voltage, which makes sense since I doubt many people lug an OG Xbox around on vacation. In fact, the only console I own with universal voltage is a slim PS2. Thanks Sony, you soulless corporation you. Nintendo even takes it a step further by hardwiring the power cable in on pretty much all of their power adapters. I really don't get this, it's like they region locked it so I can only play it in the country I bought it in. Anyway, I could order a third-party generic AC adapter, ironically the cheap clones are more universal than the genuine originals, but I have an idea for building one myself that would be even better. Let me show you the parts and what I have planned. First of all, I have to admit I already cheated a little on one of the harder parts to acquire. The N64 uses a proprietary DC plug, which you can't really find anywhere on its own. But if you want to get really technical, the whole power adapter block kind of is the DC plug, since the whole thing slides in like me and Bell Delphine's DMs. Clearly these parts aren't rare, since cheap clones are still being manufactured to this day, but you can't really buy just the case or the plug, which I guess makes sense, because even I can't imagine the demand would be that high. But to build our own adapter, we will need them. Ultimately, I'd love to make a new case from scratch, since that would mean I wouldn't have to sacrifice old stock or anything. I thought about 3D printing something, but I don't currently have access to a 3D printer, and besides, I managed to stumble upon this. It's an official power adapter, but definitely broken, making it cheap and alleviating most of my guilt about sacrificing it for what I hope is the greater good. Now, they sold it to me as no warranty, but honestly, I can't see why you wouldn't plug this in. Yeah, so this thing definitely isn't going anywhere near the mains, and kids, if you see anything like this, this is a death cable and will kill you. But don't worry, I'll be gutting pretty much all the electronics in here, including this ruined cable. Here's the plan. I want to replace the internals with a new universal power supply, preferably repurposing one of the many spares I have lying around. But in addition, I want to replace this hardwired shit with a figure eight socket to allow swapping out the cable entirely. You know, like most power adapters and electronics allow you to do. The only thing that makes this a little complicated is the voltages the N64 needs. Yes, plural. While most DC plugs are two lines, positive and negative, the N64 takes three. 12 volts 0.8 amps, 3.3 volts 2.7 amps, and ground. Which does complicate my plan ever so slightly. While it'll be pretty easy to find a generic power adapter that outputs one of these voltages, it'll be a lot harder, if not impossible, to find one that does both without specifically being designed for the N64. But we can convert between the voltages using a step up or step down converter, something that looks like this. 
So we can send that source voltage directly to the N64 while also passing it through our converter to supply the other voltage. With the right regulator, that'll also increase the current, seeing as power is a product of voltage and current. As long as the adapter is powerful enough, it should be able to make up the current difference. So, that's the plan, let's open this bad boy up. The screws are proprietary, naturally. Seems like I've been running into that a lot lately. But luckily I've had game bit screwdrivers for years, so this was no match for me. <laughs> Actually, that's not entirely true. They were kind of hard to remove. I had to put a lot of pressure down to stop my screwdriver from jumping. Honestly, I think this is kind of a flaw in the design. I mean, compared to regular screws, there's not much to grip onto. But actually, I guess that's a feature since they're literally designed to stop you from unscrewing them. But the challenge didn't stop there. Turns out this thing is also held together with plastic tabs. I hate these things. Best case, they make opening something significantly harder. Worst case, they break something permanently. You know, I don't even care how nice you are. If you put these into your product, you deserve to rot in hell. Well, speaking of hell, in situations like these, I personally turn to devilish rock and roll. By which I mean a guitar pick. It still wasn't easy, but eventually I got it to pop open. For curiosity's sake, I wanted to see the tabs I've been wrestling with, and yeah, that's them. All that struggle from these tiny little bits of plastic. Anyways, that's hopefully the hardest part of the disassembly over with. We can now take a look at what's inside. And you know, at first glance, it's actually not bad at all. It looks really clean and everything's intact. Though this is only the underside, maybe there's a blown fuse and burn marks on the top side. Speaking of which, let's take a look now. Oh, oh no. This thing is... I sh should have known. I thought at this point the board would just pop out, but I guess that was just too good to be true. God damn it. Guess I have to figure out how this works now. At first I thought maybe some tabs were involved, but I couldn't see anything. Definitely no screws. I tried to pull the case outwards thinking it might be caught on something, but no dice. It did seem like the thing wanted to come out, but it just didn't. Was it glued? Did someone plug it in, start a fire, and fuse it to the plastic? I mean, I doubt it, since there's no visible damage anywhere, but seriously, what the hell? I'm really struggling with this. I was putting as much effort as I felt I could without snapping anything, and it just wasn't coming out. To make matters worse, I looked at some disassemblies on YouTube to see what I might be missing, and no one else seemed to be struggling nearly as much as I was. For them, the board just came out like I thought it would have initially. Okay, now I'm getting mad. Why isn't this thing coming out? I thought I'd try to get a better look underneath the board, and luckily the DC plug is a separate board attached with a ribbon cable. This is actually really helpful for the mod, but it's also helpful now because I was able to route it out and take a better peek. It was really hard to see inside, even with a flashlight, but I could see something. It looked like maybe double-sided tape? If that's all it is, I'm going to be really mad. I continued wrestling with it to no avail. This was infuriating, and I started to feel like an idiot. What the hell is keeping this thing in? Eventually, I just stuck a flathead screwdriver in and pushed. Finally, it popped out, and there it is? Double-sided, sticky foam, I guess. This stuff was gripping so hard it gives flex tape a run for its money. But why is it even here? It can't be thermal conductive foam or anything because it's just attached to the plastic casing, which wouldn't effectively dissipate heat. So, as far as I can tell, it exists solely to make it harder to open. Thanks, Nintendo. Very cool. Anyways, we finally have our case pieces free, and now the hard parts should be over. Ah, oh, fuck! I shouldn't say that, I'll just end up jinxing it again. Well, the top side also looks super clean and intact. I can't see anything wrong with it. I even tested the fuses and they hadn't blown or anything. As far as I can tell, if this thing was recabled, it'd most likely still work perfectly. But it is still the wrong voltage, so that wouldn't help me at all. So while I probably could restore this back to original condition if I wanted by just replacing the cable, I'm still more interested in converting it to something more useful instead. Maybe I'll hold onto the board in case I ever need 12 and 3.3 volts and am in a 100 volt country again for some reason. I swear I'm not a hoarder. Okay, enough looking at old parts. Let's look at the new ones. Is what I would say if I hadn't run into another problem. I was confident I had plenty of spare 12 volt power adapters, and in fact I do, but when I actually looked at them I realised that none of them really had enough current to pull this project off. The vast majority of them only output 1 amp or less, and while that is enough to supply the 12 volt line, there's no way we can get an additional 2.7 amps out of the remaining current even after the step down. 
I did have one that was one and a half amps, but calculating it out, it was still just not enough, particularly since we can expect some power loss from the voltage regulator as they're never 100% efficient. An adapter that outputs two amps would be plenty, but I just don't have one here. I kind of based this project around the cheapness of being able to repurpose an adapter I already had, but now I was faced with buying a new one, which would kind of defeat the purpose. I mean, if I was going to do that, I may as well just buy one of those cheap clones and retrofit a figure eight plug to that. You know, it's kind of ironic because these generic AC adapters are kind of worthless, right? You know, it's not like anyone's trying to break into your house and steal one. And as such, I, people don't really try and sell them secondhand. So on the off chance you do want to find one secondhand, they're not particularly easy to find. It makes for one of those strange situations where something is so worthless, it's rare. But I soon discovered a life hack that was brilliant, if I do say so myself. Sure, people don't tend to sell 12 volt power adapters, but you know what they do sell? Old shitty routers. Yeah, you can get all the 12 volt power adapters you need by just buying a cheap ass router and discarding the router. An old low-end router usually goes for five dollars or even less. Sometimes my genius is... it's almost frightening. This one right here I was able to pick up for the low, low price of zero. Yeah. And the listing had been around for months. They literally couldn't give this router away. And, you know, to be fair, I don't want it either. I just want this beautiful hunk of man meat over here. 12 volts, 2 amps. More than enough to power a Nintendo 64. And it looks like, minus the case and plug, it should easily fit into our shell with some room left over for the voltage regulator. But therein lies yet another complication. How do we, uh, remove the case and plug? This is actually not a trivial task. These wall warts are usually glued together with no real way of opening them, and this one is no exception. Our choices are pretty much all destructive. I've heard of people freezing them to make the glue brittle and then using a blunt object to crack the glue open. They're frozen, damn. But I'm kind of concerned that freezing could damage the internals. Don't most electronics tell you to store in no less than 10 degrees Celsius? So I just gave in to the destructiveness. It's not like we really care about being able to put this back together. I used a flathead screwdriver and a hammer, trying to be as careful as I could about breaking the shit out of it. With a good hit on each side, the case cracked open. Okay, I actually think that went pretty well. I'll admit I was pretty nervous about accidentally breaking something inside, but it seems to have come away completely unscathed. You know, except for the casing, of course. And here you can see where the board is wired to the plug embedded on the other side of the case. Nothing a little desoldering can't fix, and now we have our 12 volt power supply. Meanwhile, here's yet another thing I was nervous about. I got my figure eight plugs, but predictably they're a lot bigger than the space where the wire used to be. So obviously I'll need to make it wider, but also this part of the case kind of juts out, which is annoying. And even worse, the case curves around here, so to be honest, I'm not really sure how this will end up looking. Admittedly, this is where 3D printing a new case would have come in clutch, but anyway. I measured it out and taped off how much space I'd need to make this work, and then just went to town with the file. This may look slow and laborious, and you know, that's because it is, but I kind of wanted to go slow so that I'd be less likely to make a grave mistake. After all, I only had one shot at this. After about two hours of filing and sandpapering, this is what I got. Okay, I'm actually pretty happy with how this came out. It's not perfect, and you can see there are parts that I accidentally scratched with the sandpaper and how there used to be that jutting out bit that I had to file away. But apart from that, it fits about as well as I could have hoped, considering the case was definitely not designed for this. And now, finally, all the hard parts should be over. Which leaves one thing remaining, getting the internals in. I retrieved the all-important proprietary DC plug and decided to do some test fitting. As expected, there's plenty of room for the 12 volt supply. Finally, let me introduce a step-down converter for producing the 3.3 volts. It's a buck converter, so it's efficient, apparently 96%, and will indeed step up the current while stepping down the voltage. It's also rated for 5 amps, so it should easily be able to produce the 2.7 amps we need. But unfortunately, I discovered a problem here that I really didn't expect. It didn't fit. I mean, from a glance, it looked like it would, but it doesn't. Huh. That's not good. That's really not good. This is like the dumbest thing to get stuck on in this project, and so deep into it too. 
Well, it's not over yet. I employed my world-renowned Tetris skills and experimented with a number of different placements until I found one that just might work. If I place the buck converter back here on its side, then everything does fit. Of course, I'll need to place some insulation between the supply and the converter to prevent short circuits, but I think this will just work. You may have noticed I wired up the AC plug off camera while I was fitting it, and as such, I think it's fitting to do a smoke test. Not that it should be broken, but, you know, we did hit it with a hammer just before. Okay, I've got the cable in, but it's not in the wall yet. Here goes plugging it into the wall. And here goes switching it on. Uh, uh. Okay, good news, I'm not dead and my house isn't on fire. And look at that, we're getting a solid 12 volts as expected from the supply. Now we can proceed to the voltage converter. I'll wire it up, but I also need to set it to 3.3 myself since it's actually adjustable and can output a wide variety of voltages. But funnily enough, I actually had some trouble with this at first. No matter how much I adjusted, it just seemed to output the same 12 volts going into it. And I started to worry that this was dead and I'd have to wait for another to arrive. But it turns out this is actually a common misconception with this regulator. Apparently it's set to output 20 volts from the factory, but since we're only supplying 12, we need to turn it down a lot before it starts to make a difference. Eventually I got to 3.3 and yep, that all looks good. Now what happened next I didn't manage to film, but it turns out I made a big mistake by wiring it up outside of the case like this because all of the wires were either way too long or way too short. So here's me re-soldering all the wires I actually measured out in advance. Lesson here I guess is always wire up in the case, which I probably should have known already. Also I want to mention that for the DC plug I didn't even need to look up a pinout. The case itself has one molded into it. How convenient! Almost as if it were planned, hmm? Also, if you're wondering why the pieces are upside down, that's because this is actually the top half, which is slightly narrower than the bottom half. So positioning them in here basically ensures that this thing will actually close. With another fitting, it all came together as planned. I actually think that looks pretty good. And of course, taping up the bottom side of the regulator to insulate it from the main supply and prevent any potentially dangerous short circuits. I also insulated the AC plug pins just to be safe. Man, that should do us. Time to plug it in again, and I'll test the pins just to be sure. 12 volts on one of them, 3.3 on two, and ground on three. It all checks out. Now at the moment, since the components are smaller and shaped differently than the old board, they rattle around in the case, which is kind of annoying and potentially dangerous if one component rattles into another and short circuits something. So I decided I needed to stick them in place. I did briefly consider drilling holes into the case and using screws somehow since that would be the most stable, but there still aren't really holes in the board to do that, and I also didn't think it would look very good from the outside either. I'm sure some people would also have used hot glue in this situation, but eventually I decided to just use mounting tape. This stuff was pretty sticky and I think it will be able to hold it all in. I had to stack up a few layers to get over one of these mounting pegs on the case. I probably could have filed it off, but yeah. I stuck everything down and it seems pretty stable. Check this out. Yeah, I think that'll be okay, at least for a homemade project like this. Which means it's time for the ultimate test. Will it fry my Nintendo 64? Okay, with all the testing I'm relatively confident it won't, but you never know. With a satisfying pop, it's one cohesive unit again. All right, here we go. Power's on. So far, nothing's blown up. Let's switch it on. Uh-oh. We got a red light, but no picture. Oh, wait, of course. I can't believe I almost forgot how to N64. Oh, thank God, it was just the cartridge. Yeah, they had us the first half, I'm not gonna lie. Well, it looks good so far. Let's try playing some games. As far as I can tell, this thing is working flawlessly. Goldeneye works, Mario 64 works, and it's super rewarding to know it's running off something I put together myself. Well, I guess Huawei put most of it together, but still. Why Huawei? In a way, I've kind of converted it from an external power supply to an internal power supply, since it could technically just stay in forever and all I have to do is unplug the figure eight cable. I did want to do a few more tests before I called it done, so I did something you probably shouldn't do at home. I ran it with the cover off. I wanted to see if any of the voltages significantly dropped under load. Carefully, I poked the multimeter at the pins on the buck converter, which is actually in a really convenient spot for testing both the 12 and 3.3 volt lines. 
Yeah, I was a little concerned about the AC plug right next to it, but luckily we did insulate it earlier and the voltages all looked good. Under load, playing Goldeneye, no noticeable drops. Finally, I wanted to do an endurance temperature test. Both the supply and the converter will emit some heat under load, so I wanted to see how much. So I played a nice, fulfilling, and totally not unfair game of Mario Party 3. And after about an hour and a half, it was barely warm at all. I think this is good to go. So I am pretty happy with how this turned out, and I think it'll work great. But in retrospect, I kind of wish I'd gone the 3D printing route instead of case modification. Even though this looks fine, it's not perfect, and now all I can think about is what it would be like if it was. See, with 3D printing, not only could I have shaped it for the figure 8 plug, I also could have shaped the internals for the parts we ended up putting in, rather than having to stick it all down with mounting tape and play Tetris with the voltage regulator. So I guess what I've learned is I need a 3D printer. Anyways, for now, I'm just happy that not only can I plug this N64 into any outlet in my country, with the right figure 8 cable, I could plug it into the wall in any country in the world. You know, someday. Subscribe to Mac Game Seat.